Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Matt Iglesias. Matt is the co-founder of Vox and a senior correspondent focused on politics and economic policy. Matt is also a previous guest of the podcast and returns today to discuss his new book, One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger. Matt, welcome back to the show. Really glad to be here. Well, it's great to have you on. You are quite the uh, internet celebrity and a writer and contributor, and it's been great to engage with you on these issues through the years. In fact, I think our history goes back to the great glory days of blogging right after the great financial crisis and a lot of good times back then. But you've written now your third book, right? This is your third book you've written. Is that right? It is, yes. Okay. It's a very interesting book. I enjoyed reading it. And I think it ties together a lot of the different pieces and areas you've been writing on through the years with a kind of a common overarching link that brings them all together. And that's population in our country. We'll get back to that. Just a quick question about another area where you also happen to follow closely, and that's the Fed. And I promise listeners we'll get back to Matt's book shortly. But for those who don't know, Matt is quite the Fed watcher himself. He actually covers the Fed fairly closely and has had great things to say about it. So, Matt, one of the, for me, more exciting developments has been the Fed's new framework, the average inflation targeting framework, which incorporates makeup policy. And it didn't go as far as I would have liked it. As you know, I would have liked nominal GDP level targeting. But I think it's a step in the right direction. I'm just wondering, what was your take on that development. Yeah, I mean the the move to average, you know, is definitely good. That is a a step in the right direction. You know, I, I sort of thought it was a missed opportunity to go further simply because I think the reality is that the Fed is not going to want to change frameworks a lot. Right? So I mean there's like you know, two ways you could judge anything in politics, right? One is you can say, okay, this is a step in the right direction. I'm happy about it. Or you can say, okay, it fell short of what they should do. And my read is that, you know, we had years of argument after the financial crisis about how the Fed should do things differently. And then they came out with this new framework with great fanfare. And I guess I'm a little more inclined to see the glasses half empty, given that I don't think it's likely that they're going to go update it again. I mean, I think you and I just have the exact same opinion as to what they should do. But we just had actually in the sort of hard shutdown months, such a potent example of how relying on the inflation calculations can actually be really problematic, precisely in a stressful economic moment, right? I mean, you're sitting here and like, you know, you got, you know, so it's like my cousin is doing college half on Zoom, half in the dorms, paying full tuition. I mean, I think common sense says that's inflationary, but I don't know. Like, how is the BLS supposed to sort that out, right? Like, it's so much more of a complicated bureaucratic process than I think people, you know, like a lot of prestige economists are like so far from the data, Right. They just look at this stuff and like, well, you know, you should use real quantities. We should adjust things for inflation. But you like get in the nitty gritty and it's like, what does any of that mean? Right. Whereas we continue to count aggregate income and spending flows pretty well. And we could see that in the peak of the crisis, aggregate spending went down quite a lot. It rebounded nicely, which is good. But like we can. We can just track it. Like, do we get back on track, right? And let people know it's like the prices of stuff may change. The quality of the goods may change. What is even for sale may change. Like the real side of the economy is so important, but it's so nuanced and it's so complicated that it's like, there's just tremendous value to focusing genuinely on the nominal aggregates. And then Powell has, you know, he has exacerbated the Bernanke era tendency to serve as a kind of almost like a just like a takes guy about fiscal policy, which I don't love. Like, I agree with the chairman's fiscal policy thoughts, 
So I, I'm not like that offended by it, but it doesn't strike me as really what the Fed should be doing. In terms of promoting fiscal policy through his bully pulpit, is that what you're saying? Well, because it feels to me like a ducking of responsibility on some level. No, I mean, if you want to say, right, as I think Chairman Greenspan might have said at some point in the 90s, if you want to offer an opinion that's like, okay, this fiscal policy decision that was just made is going to force me to raise interest rates to prevent something terrible from happening. Like, that's fine. But the thing that, you know, really started under Bernanke and Powell has gotten like deeper into it, where you say like, okay, you guys need to deal with this. It's like, like, I agree with him that Congress should do that. But also it's like, he should do his job. Right. But it makes it easier for him to do less. Like, why isn't the Fed doing more QE right now, for example? Why haven't they gone into negative territory with interest rates? Why haven't they explored yield curve control further? What has stopped them? And maybe you could argue one thing that has stopped them is the hope there'll be stimulus 2.0 just around the corner. So, in fact, I read an article today along these very lines that because Trump last night, at least first last night, this is October 7th, so last night, October 6th, he tweeted out they were canceling the stimulus talks, and then shortly later he said they're back on in some form. But an article came out based on that that first tweet that said this will open the door for more aggressive QE now. And I'm like, well, why didn't we have that before these tweets came out? Right, and if you want to just say factually, okay, we are going to stabilize nominal aggregates and we are going to use QE to do that. And if you, Congress, don't like QE, then like we would not do as much if there was more stimulative fiscal policy. It's up to you, right? Like they are the elected people's representatives. Like they should decide what happens. But the Fed has a mandate. It has a framework. Like they should follow the framework. Right. And this was, I think, the older, I mean, it was different because we were talking more about a high interest rate environment. But you would say, look, like if you're mad, if you don't want the interest rates to be so high, make the budget deficit smaller is like a statement of what the mandate means. Right. Or at least what what Chairman Greenspan felt the mandate meant. And, you know, at the time, I know the Clinton administration felt that he was kind of stepping on their toes, but it seemed like a realistic account of sort of monetary policy's function in the economy. And and George H.W. Bush, I was I was really young, but, you know, people who were around then say they were very upset at, at the way Greenspan played that role. But he was articulating facts about the Fed's reaction function, whereas now I don't totally understand what Powell is saying. Because as you say, then it's like, well, so if Congress doesn't do it, then he's going to use emergency measures, or maybe he will, maybe he won't. Josh Barrow did an article saying like the Fed could create some kind of special like bridge facility because state and local governments know they'll get money if Biden becomes president. It's all very, it's weird. (laughs) Yeah, no, I hear you and I'm very sympathetic to you. And if I had to take Chairman Powell's side just to play devil's advocate here, maybe you know he's thinking or coming from the perspective that you want fiscal policy to be first in line to respond because they're more effective at getting transfers directly to households or to states or something along those lines. That might be what he's thinking. But I agree with you. I mean, in general, if you're not hitting your inflation target, and I agree, like you said earlier, it may be hard to know for sure where we are presently. But even if you're not hitting income levels that existed pre-crisis, you should be doing something now, not waiting for Congress to act. So uh, it is a bit of a puzzle. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's a it's a tough one. Right. But we have this. I don't know. I mean, they call it, you know, it's a basically independent monetary policy functioning body. And the sort of official reasons for that now all feel very outdated. It's like it's been so long since we've worried about an excessively inflationary economy. And now the, the institutions interact with each other in this way that doesn't make a ton of sense, really. You know, because if you think about it differently, right? I mean, if you think about the Fed chair as a more conventional presidential appointee, I mean, Trump did pick 
Chairman Powell put him out there, right? And so if you had, okay, it was the statement of the administration's policy that, look, we don't want to do more QE. We think the right way to fix the economy is more aggressive fiscal stimulus, direct transfers to households and businesses, because that'll avoid disruptions. That would be totally reasonable. Like if it was a statement of the administration's policy, but it is, I, I mean, who knows? Like, no, <laughs> it's a little unclear what the Trump administration's desires on, on fiscal policy are. So that's its own kind of conundrum. But, it, you know, as an independent actor, it's a, it's a strange one. I mean, I think the persistent low interest rate environment is just challenging for a lot of people in terms of how they, I mean, on paper, it's good. Right. If you have a worthy idea for business investment, it's easy to borrow money. And that should be a good thing. Right. Like I, I put solar panels on my roof and, you know, it's a big upfront cost, but it was really cheap to finance. So so that's good. Right. But in terms of how we think the political system should work, I think most people's intuition is that government spending should mostly be paid for with taxes, that the taxes should be efficient, that monetary policy should operate quietly in the background without crazy new programs and weird acronyms. And just like none of that is true in a persistent low interest rate kind of environment. And I don't know, you know, I mean, I don't think the powers that be have fully thought it through. I was just seeing the other day how long it's been since the CBO forecast of future interest rates was undershot. So it was 1994 was the last time. You know, in general in life, if you, again, I mean, nobody's perfect, right? Predicting the future is really hard. But if for 25 straight years, your forecast is off in the same direction, there's something wrong, right? Absolutely. Hey, let me ask another question about the Fed, and I promise we'll get back to your book. So next year, the chair position is going to come open again. Well, 2022, I think, is when his term... Powell's term expires, but the discussion surrounding it will be next year. So I'm hearing talk on you know both sides that if Biden wins the presidency, there's some progressives that aren't happy with Chair Powell, and they want someone who's going to be harder on bank regulation, someone who's more aggressive on equitable issues, income inequality issues. And then people on the right, of course, may not be happy as well. Trump may not be happy as well. But what is your take? I mean, you're, you're there in the heartbeat of the city. Is Next year going to be a really interesting year with the chair nomination, or should it be an easy, smooth transition? So there is an ongoing dispute among progressives as to whether to think of the important question in the Fed as the macro stabilization role or the bank regulatory role. I am much more on the macro stabilization side, but a lot of people don't see it that way. To a lot of people, progressive people, their primary interest in the Fed is the Fed as bank regulator. Those people are very critical of Powell. They would really like to see him replaced by somebody who they think will be will be tougher. The banks, people who take a more of a of a labor market centric view, you know, think Powell's been fine. They did not necessarily favor firing Janet Yellen and bringing Powell in. And I think from a certain partisan perspective, it's like the last two Democratic presidents reappointed their Republican appointed predecessors. And there's there's a certain mood of just like, thanks for your service. We're going to put a Democrat in, which is separate. So, you know, Lael Brainerd, who's been on the board this whole time, starting with Obama, has often dissented from regulatory moves of the Powell Fed, but been very supportive of him on interest rate policy. You know, she could be a plausible replacement for him that would sort of meet everybody's needs. The unions don't like her because of a completely unrelated dispute about trade from the early 90s. And I don't know why they won't let go of that. It doesn't seem important in any way, but she she was Undersecretary of Treasury for International Affairs in the Clinton administration. And they have some beef with her that's like not, I don't endorse this at all. But so she's also a plausible candidate for treasury secretary. But I think in some ways, the union issues with her might be more severe there. Then Rafael Bostich is also in consideration at treasury, but also potentially for a bigger Fed role, chair of the Atlanta Fed currently. Sarah Bloom Raskin, I think is the other major treasury contender 
because she's married to a member of the House of Representatives, I think is seen as someone who would be an inappropriate Fed choice, although she has experience there too. So I think that's just kind of like some of the math, right? I mean, also, I I don't know that your listeners will be in sympathy with this, but, you know, a a Biden administration is going to have a lot of complicated diversity math to kind of work out in terms of its cabinet. So decisions that have nothing to do with economic policy in terms of like who becomes secretary of state are going to have knock-on consequences for other kinds of appointments. They have some very complicated flowcharts, I believe, in the transition. That's interesting. We'll give you plenty to write about next year. (laughs) Never a dull moment, that's for sure, covering the Fed, as well as this transition year that may be upon us next year. Well, let's segue back into your book. Again, your book is titled One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger. And before we get into it, I just want to ask, what motivated you to write this? I'm a kind of generalist writer. I roam across a lot of different subjects. I don't have a a single beat that I work on, you know, which is fine. But I sometimes try to think about book ideas. Agents would talk to me or editors would talk to me and, you know, wasn't that interested. But I came to see that one topic I'm very interested in is housing policy. And I feel that a lot of the sort of high income, high cost cities in the United States have made it much too difficult to build houses and would receive a lot of benefits from more house building and therefore more growth in that respect. But as somebody who writes on and covers urban issues, I came to travel to more cities that are places like Cleveland, places like Rochester, New York, places like Milwaukee, you know, places that are a little bit down on their luck, and talk to officials there about things they are doing to try to change things around. And it started occurring to me that there are lots of specific ideas for, say, Rochester that are fine. But Rochester is just one of dozens of mid-sized former industrial cities in places with cold weather that are suffering from these kind of interlocking problems of population flight, tax base loss, infrastructure decay. And you couldn't actually do the like best practices that experts have for each of these cities, for all of them. Because the premise in each case is that something or other you do, right? Whether it's you get Toyota to bring their North American headquarters here, or you do something cool with infrastructure, or whatever else it is you do. Like The idea is like make people want to live in Rochester again. But Rochester and Utica and Rome and Buffalo and Binghamton, just in upstate New York, are like all in this boat. Right. And then you've got two or three cities in Western Massachusetts, two cities in Connecticut, then big Midwestern cities, Detroit, St. Louis, Milwaukee. And like they can't all have this kind of revival. Right. It's not a um, it doesn't work in equilibrium, basically. And then also it would be sad If people like it's really cool that Nashville and Austin and some of these midsize Sunbelt cities are growing really fast, it wouldn't actually be better. I mean, some cranks are like, oh, you're ruining Austin. Keep it weird. But like, it's great. Lots of stuff is being built. There's tons of cool new restaurants there. Like, it's good. So I started to think, well, maybe it would be better if there were just more people. So I also cover immigration a little because Donald Trump really hates immigrants and try to look at some of this stuff. And, you know, immigration is just like, it's very beneficial. I don't know if So Brian Kaplan wrote this book on on the case for open borders, which I think is a little extreme for non-economic reasons. But he really goes through the economics of immigration in a very impressive and I think convincing way that it's just like, it's really good in a way most people don't appreciate. And the problems are addressable with measures that are so much smaller than like, no, you have to live in Cuba forever. Because the benefits to the immigrants themselves are so large that if there's like a minor kind of negative impact on somebody else, it's like really easy to find win-win kind of solutions for this. So then I'm thinking, okay, it's like we can fix all these cities problems. We can have more immigrants. I'm also interested a little bit in classic progressive stuff about, about the welfare state and child poverty and this and that. But then I started hearing some of 
this right wing guy, Lyman Stone's research about this stuff, about how people have fewer children than they say they want to have, about how this fertility gap is really growing, that all this stuff that's like, oh, like millennials don't want to have children anymore because of climate change. Like, there's very little research basis for that. The main thing that people say is that they can't afford childcare. And then you can look at international estimates of the sort of impact of paid leave programs, cash grant programs, and Oftentimes, those are undertaken by kind of far-right Central European governments whose instinct is to say they don't like the idea of a welfare state, but they like get into natalism, and then they wind up disappointed by the results. But if you read those results as a person who's like an American progressive person who thinks that reducing child poverty by a third is a really good idea, and then it also turns out that the same programs that will do that lead to maybe a quarter more children per woman being born. Like, that's an interesting kind of secondary result that people don't know about, that Democrats don't like to talk about, because only religious people think this is interesting. So then I kind of added it up, and it's like, I I don't know, it's like, maybe we should just have more people, right? I used to cover foreign policy. It's been a long time since, since I covered foreign policy. But I do follow the NBA quite closely. And I was really freaked out when Daryl Morey tweeted in favor of Hong Kong protesters and the league lost their China broadcast rights and everybody lost it at him, right? And like the players were like, well, you shouldn't say that. And Yeah, that was a very disappointing episode to follow as an NBA fan for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was really weird. You know, it was bad. And then you can say, okay, well, I'm going to get mad at the league, like they did the wrong thing. But it turns out that Hollywood studios are doing very similar things. There was this crazy story where there was like a Mercedes marketing campaign where for some reason they decided they should quote the Dalai Lama in a ad campaign for Mercedes, which I don't know why. I mean, you would do that, but they did. And the Chinese government lost it. And the CEO of Daimler winds up doing this like groveling apology. And and this is like a German story, not an American story, but like sort of appalling. And the extent to which the dream of the 90s where economic integration was supposed to spread liberal values to China That has really not worked out, right? Instead, the size of the Chinese market means that they are now really impacting the sort of speech and practice of American multinational companies. It's right now very focused in entertainment industries, but you see elements of it in academia, and it will grow as they become the world's biggest market for things. And the United States has been the world's biggest market I mean, nobody has been alive in circumstances when we weren't. And before that, it was Britain, which is not the kind of place, even in the 19th century, that would do that. It was a much more classical liberal kind of paradigm. And there's a sort of big issue. Like, politicians talk about China all the time. Like, there's some report the other day about how many warships we need. But it's, like, relatively unlikely, I think, that we're going to see surface naval combat I mean, we might, but yeah, there's just like lots of good reasons to not have a war, but it's very likely that we will continue to have businesses that want to do business in large markets around the world and that they will feel impacted by the Chinese government's attitude toward things. And I think there would be a real benefit to the United States in trying to remain clearly number one for the long haul. So, you know, this is not a, it's not like a, Council on Foreign Relations type book. If it was, I would, I don't know, there would be stuff about like what kind of rocket launchers we should sell to Vietnam or something like that. But but the underlying basis of American geopolitical strength is our economy, I think, is not our military. And if you try to play the like USSR in the 70s game of what we have really cool missiles, even though our economy is a shambles, like that doesn't work, we know, in the long run. And we're not, Trump likes to talk about China a lot. And Obama would sort of vaguely invoke the idea of winning the 21st century. I don't even know what Biden 
thinks he's saying about anything. But it's both like a presumption of American politics that we should be number one, but also not something anyone is focused on. Like, what are we going to do? So I wanted to write a book that just like it ties us all together. It says like, we should set this high goal. We do it with immigrants. We do it with babies. We adjust our transportation policy. We adjust the way our our housing policies work. I even get a, a small plug in there for raising the R star up. We can have better stabilization. So, you know, it's it's all there. It's all there. Everything comes back to the Fed, ultimately. <laughs> Thank you for that plug there, Matt. No, but it's, it's a great book because it is. It, it ties together all these different themes. It ties together the declining fertility rate in the U.S., immigration debates, housing issues, transportation, our engagement with China, and population growth, in your case, tripling the size of the U.S., is both kind of the the solution, but also some of the challenges we have to work through to get to that point. And I was going to read your introduction. I'll let the listeners do that. But you you come out very forcefully up front talking about we should not resign ourselves to being second or third place in the world. We need to maintain our number one status. And we can do that by growing our population to one billion and in the process be forced to deal with some of these issues that we haven't. And as you mentioned, you know, most politicians would agree with this. We want to be number one, but both the right and the left really aren't clearly and carefully thinking through all the implications of their policies and how it affects that that trajectory. But I guess what was surprising, Matt, for me as I read the book was this framing, keeping America number one. I mean, that's not a typical framing from a progressive person, right? Many progressives would get kind of squeamish if you said something like that. They might say, yeah, we love more immigrants we you know maybe we love changing housing policy that agree with all your you know your other points but i got to imagine you got some kind of blowback it's interesting you know something that happens whenever you do a book right it takes a this was a pretty fast book in the scheme of things but still it takes a long time from when you write that proposal to when it comes out and a lot of things change i do think the theme of anti-patriotism the left sort of rose a lot in salience over the past year while I was working on this. So it became more of a ideologically interesting book to some conservative people. I had a good reception on Ben Shapiro's podcast, on on Glenn Beck's show, and a bit more of a a challenging one for progressives. So the, the New York Times assigned my book to an Englishman, Felix Salmon, who was a, you know, he just, he just wants to, so that was his r- response. He was like, well, these are fine ideas, but like, what's all this stuff about American greatness? But, you know, he just wants to tax our tea and stamps and things. You can't count foreigners. So I think that's an interesting tension, right? I mean, if you watch Kamala Harris give a speech on the campaign trail, she'll be surrounded by little American flags, right? Like it's totally normal for progressive politicians in the United States to invoke the images and languages of American. And you look at her speech at the convention. It's very different. I mean, I've covered elections in Germany and in Germany for reasons that I think I don't need to belabor. Patriotism is really quite stigmatized there. And you'll see flags on government office buildings, but individual politicians do not attempt to associate themselves with the iconography of German patriotism. Whereas Joe Biden, the day before we record this podcast, he wants to deliver a speech. His house is in Wilmington, Delaware, but he goes several hours from his house to the Gettysburg battlefield, which is both within driving distance, but is a symbolically resonant point. And he gives a speech about how we are once again a house divided. He invokes Lincoln. He's standing by flags. Now, we take that for granted, right? Like, when you see him doing that, we're not like, oh, man, (laughs) progressives are going to be mad about this, right? It's so normal in America, but it is true that it is a gap between where progressive practical politicians are and where a lot of left-wing intellectuals are. And so to write like an actual book instead of a schlocky campaign speech that invokes these same ideas, some people found troubling. But I actually think it's important. I mean, there's sort of factual, like for one thing, like the Chinese government is actually really, really bad. And I think it's good to be clear about that. But I also think, you know, thematically, this is one place where I differ from, say, Kaplan's book on on open borders. I mean, he's a libertarian, not, not a progressive, but I think aligns with a lot of leftist intellectuals on this. But 
part of why the United States has a successful history and track record with immigration, I think, is that we have a strong civic culture of patriotism. We have a lot of neutral civic symbols. We have a lot of, I'm sure foreigners think it's silly that Americans will get into very earnest arguments about like, what would Alexander Hamilton think about something? Because of course it's a little dumb, right? But like, We have these figures who are like an agreed upon pantheon of national heroes, and we have debates about them, and we talk very, you know, Lincoln would say, and it's it's part of what makes America an open society, right? That like we can say these people were the fathers of our country, right? Even though, you know, not just like recent, I mean, Asian, Latino people, African-Americans, but like people like me, I am not a literal descendant of anybody who was here in the founding period, but those people are still the founding fathers of our country, right? And that's why your parents could be from Vietnam or Mexico or whatever. And it's why we have a particular trouble around the descendants of enslaved people and of indigenous people is tricky because that doesn't fit as nicely into the sort of patriotic story of most of America. But still, to me, the foundation of inclusion rests on the idea that like those ideals and those symbols have real value. So I think that's a very traditional kind of American idea that I'm expressing there that has come under some question lately, but I think basically the old thinking is correct. Okay, Matt, let's move into the material in your book and I will fly by chapter one on the relative decline, just briefly highlight that China can actually never catch up to us on a per capita basis, but still be larger than us on an absolute total basis and have that influence on the world economy that might concern us. But let's move to the the chapters that I think are interesting and you get into some of the issues that people have a hard time with, and that is having a billion people in America. So chapter two, you start this discussion and you talk about America being empty. So speak to that. Is America really empty? There's not a lot of people in the United States. So the sort of headline conclusion here. It's like a billion Americans. It sounds like a lot, but we would have the population density of France and we would be lower than Italy, Germany, Netherlands, UK. Like Asian countries are way denser than European ones. So the United States is just an incredibly sparsely populated country. Then you could compare us to our friends up north, the Canadians who are even more sparsely populated. And I think most questions you could ask about, well, would it be bad if we tripled the population? You could ask, compare us to Canada, right? Like Michael Anton at one point was like, well, our high schools will be overcrowded. But American high schools aren't any more crowded than Canadian high schools. We just have more high schools. (laughs) You know, it's pretty obvious when you think about it, right? Like Canada is just a country where there's a vast, empty wilderness in which nothing is happening. And it's very cold. And that's, you know, it's fine, but like, it doesn't accomplish anything. It's not like they all have huge houses. We have bigger houses than they do. You know, houses are construction projects, schools you build, all kinds of things like that. And we're we're richer than them, which is good. Because nobody, I mean, I guess they tried to have Blackberry there. But usually if you're like an ambitious Canadian person with like really big ideas, you try to move to America, just like New Zealand, Australia, maybe London, because like people want to do things in big markets and big cities. And that's where big opportunities are. So the United States just has like a ton. We're a big country because it's physically expansive, but we have lots and lots of room Lots of prosperous countries are much more densely populated than we are, and plenty of space to bring more people in. Well, this chapter really ties together with some of your other chapters about having more children, the comeback cities. So just to kind of tie this together, we have low density, but we're also bleeding in certain parts of the country. You mentioned some of these Midwestern cities. So Detroit, I was really shocked to read in your book, its population for the city itself went from 1.85 million to 380,000. That's a huge decline. Uh, Is that just the city proper itself or the metropolitan area as well? It's just the the city proper. And but what's been an interesting trend is that we've now started to see in Detroit and in Chicago, whole metro areas have started losing people. 
you know, on some level, you know, we have World War II, and then after World War II, we have a lot of people get cars, which is good. We have a lot of new home building, which is good. A lot of central cities lose population because people move to the suburbs. And, you know, that's fine. Like, that's that's the march of progress. But then in the West Coast and in the South, mostly, the central city population stabilizes and the suburbs grow, but the central city also grows. Then the big Northeastern cities like New York, DC, Boston, that started to happen. But in the smaller Northeastern cities and the Midwestern cities, the central cities have kept losing people because national population growth rate is low. And it gets very problematic when you reach a certain level. Like in Detroit, they literally have trouble keeping the traffic lights functioning, you know, which is an extreme case. Like, you know, you just look at like Baltimore, right, which is a city with many problems and they got to address them. But a ton of their budget goes to meeting pension obligations that the larger city of the past incurred at a time when they just needed more people to do more stuff. And that's really hard, right? Like you're not, if you don't have a superstar industry like Google or or Wall Street banks, and you just kind of have this monkey on your back of there used to be hundreds of thousands of more people living here, and now we need to pay off their debts. That's really challenging. And it's, if it was one place, you can just say, okay, like move, you know, like it's fine. And I used to have this like very neoliberal view of that, but it's actually so many places and there's so much, you know, I don't know what you call it, like acute fixed capital, right? In the housing stock, the buildings, the infrastructure, and its market value has become very low because there's like not people there, right? But the like the K in the production function, it like actually decays because it doesn't have any economic value. And it's an incredible waste at a time when we have lots of other places that are very overburdened, right? So like you can't just substitute air traffic control capacity in Detroit for air traffic control capacity in New York because like they're different locations, right? But like we have all this stuff in the Midwest that is not used at anywhere near capacity, still many millions of people living there, sometimes freaking out and voting for Donald Trump and and various other kinds of problems. So I do think we should take it seriously. But then a question becomes like, do we have solutions that are non-destructive? Right. Because you turn around and, you know, you look at like, well, okay, we'll we'll put a tax on imported metal. Like that's like a real thing that happened. And like, how does that actually help? Whereas if we had systematically higher rate of population growth, then places that can offer cheapness compared to the big coastal cities and other stuff like that, like they're just like good place for people to live and can stabilize. Yeah. And you mentioned how in places like Detroit, the the value of the housing is declining so much that landlords have no incentive to maintain them. So people who rent, they're living in homes that are increasingly run down. I remember a few you know years back, look, going online and looking at homes in Detroit, thinking, man, those homes are so cheap. But then you realize there's no reason to move there. There's no, the work isn't there. The networks of people aren't there. But the argument you make in the book is all of these problems, or many of these problems could be solved by having a lot of immigration coming in and filling these holes, filling these cities that are bleeding. You mentioned the example of Cleveland. Cleveland is an amazing city, has the Cleveland Clinic, has a great orchestra, museums, and it would benefit immensely from people coming in and filling in and providing a tax base. And And you also highlight there's this kind of this snowball effect. When people leave, it kind of reinforces itself and more people want to leave, young people want to leave, there's less opportunity. And to reverse that, it's going to take a, a mass immigration to to fill these holes in the city. So I think it's a very compelling point. And and let's talk about some of the practical policy suggestions along those lines. So you mentioned decentralized federal government, national renewal visas, and new universities. So touch on those and how they could be used to make sure people end up in Cleveland and Detroit. Yeah. So one of these ideas, this is something the U.S. Conference of Mayors has come out for that a lot of sort of smaller Midwestern mayors have talked about, but is let cities sponsor extra visas, right? So right now we have a guest worker program called H-1B, where a company that wants to bring people with technical skills over to work for them on a temporary basis can do that. And we have a quantitative limit on how many people can come on visas like that. You need to do a lottery 
So you could create a second program for cities rather than companies to sponsor people with technical skills and say, well, you can come here, right? And so suddenly, if you have a pool of skilled technical workers who are eligible to live in Cleveland or Detroit or whatever else, that becomes a good reason for whether it's an outsourcing, you know, a company like Infosys or Accenture could build an office there and, and the people could work there, or a big US tech company, you know, a Microsoft or a Google Gold might say, well, we should have a satellite campus there, right? And it provides a shot in the arm to cities that have meaningful assets in terms of social capital, civic institutions, much more attractive house prices, but just don't have opportunity. You know, so it's it's an opportunity for the immigrants. But once it's there, right, like if there was offices to hire white collar people at high wages to work for market leading companies in Cleveland, some people would say either because like they're sick of the high prices in San Francisco or just because they have family in Northern Ohio. Yeah, I would like to work there. It stops being a kind of like, I control myself by looking at the real estate prices, but eh, it's not practical to like, suddenly it's a real option. Like, yeah, maybe I should go do this. Decentralizing the federal government, you know, the idea here is for the longest time, Washington had this reputation as a kind of backwater place, but it's now become actually one of the richest and one of the most expensive metro areas in the country, which means I think we should think a little bit harder about like, do we need all this white collar federal employment here? Obviously, a lot of stuff in the government, like, does like the State Department is in Washington for a very specific reason. But like the NIH is in Bethesda, sort of just because, right? Like the guys who write medical research grants, they're not like rushing over to the White House. Now, obviously, there's a pandemic now. There's a somewhat special circumstance. Most of them are like, you know, they're trying to develop cancer drugs, right? And so that could be in Cleveland, which has a big healthcare cluster where the sort of real wage would go further, where the jobs that would be lost in this area would be quickly recouped as a sort of, you know, rebound for the costs. You know, I also talk a little bit about the idea of trying to get even the private sector to sort of deconcentrate out of a few places. You know, which is a tougher one, I think, in a lot of ways. It cuts against the grain of American policymaking, which tends to take a very arm's length kind of view of things. But it's it's crazy to go to the Bay Area where like everybody is mad at tech companies for like hiring too many people at high wages. And then to go to like almost anywhere in the United States and the local elected officials, you know, Republicans or Democrats, like they would be so happy for like Apple to build a huge new corporate campus in Kansas City. But like where they want to do it in Palo Alto, the city is yelling at them constantly. And they're like, oh, you're going to have too much traffic jams. And it's like, if there's something the federal government can do to like bust up that dysfunctional relationship between tech in the Bay Area and finance in New York, I think it would be useful. All right. Let's talk about children and families now for a little bit. So immigration is one way to get the numbers up and probably the most practical way to quickly get numbers up because it will take a lifetime of rearing and education and lots of investment in human capitals, economists would say, whereas with immigrants, they come right in. Some other countries borne the cost of investing in these people. And one of the things that you highlight is there's this tension between the two parties in terms of promoting family policies. So like on the right, Typically, they're a little more allergic to immigrants. They love families, but they don't have policies that strongly support families. On the left, they are more open to immigrants, but then they don't, they get kind of nervous talking about pro family policies for various reasons. So, between those two, you definitely have some roadblocks to get through. But you make the compelling case for population in general that the more people you have, the larger the markets, the greater the specialization, the more productive. And and ultimately, I think page 140, this is where I was looking for, this is to me the gold standard, more idea. So it's one thing to say we have bigger markets, more specialization, which is true, but more people means greater probability of Einstein's being born, smart people, the distribution of intelligence, the people who are going to solve climate problems, the people who are going to solve technological hurdles, you got to have them. And and I think ultimately, this is a question of, do you look at people as stomachs or brains? 
If you look at them as stomachs, then you worry about the climate crisis and say you only have one child. But if you look at them as brains, you want to say, look, let's get more people in here solving the climate problems through innovation. And fewer people means fewer chances of having those smart people to solve the problems. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I got Paul Romer to blurb my book and probably could have had a more explicit discussion of like Romer growth model in there. Because it's part of what is inspiring my thinking there. I think a lot of normal people underestimate the role of innovation and ideas, broadly speaking, in driving prosperity, even if you get it on on some level, right? But it's like when you invent something that is really useful, then because you can copy ideas, it doesn't matter that there's a large number of people. It's not like, you know, it's so it's like if I find a coconut tree, then if there's a lot of people, like they don't get a lot of coconuts, right? But if I invent something awesome, then it doesn't matter. Like I can share it with a billion people. I can share it with an arbitrary number of people. But the more people there are, the more likely it is that somebody will invent something awesome. So the per person living standards are higher in the larger group, right? So, the, I mean, it's a very abstract model, but it's also true, right? If you look sort of at macro historical stuff, right? So it's like the indigenous population in Tasmania was at an incredibly low level of technology compared to even Maine, Australia. It's just not enough people. They're not like worse people than Australian Aborigines or anybody else anywhere, but it's such a small island. It was such a low quantity of people. And like, frankly, just like most of us don't invent anything particularly useful over the course of our lives, right? There's a lot of free riding on a relatively small number of people who come up with stuff that kind of moves the ball forward. And also a lot of invention, you know, I mean, this is being a little bit flip about it, but like a lot of innovation in practice is incremental. You know, it's not just like one guy comes down from the mountaintop and is like, here's how we're going to have electric lighting in our houses, right? There's stuff about the filaments, there's stuff about the vacuum. So like, you need to have a lot of people around for this to actually, this iterative process to actually work. And it's, you know, it's one reason why it'll be interesting to see what happens with remote work in the long run. But traditionally, at least, like big growing companies that like want to do things have wanted to be in major metro areas, like places where other companies are. And like lots of stuff is going on because they don't really think that you can get it done in total isolation from the rest of the universe. Yeah, absolutely. And and let me plug Julian Simon here. I know you've seen me tweet him a few times. Maybe you're getting sick of me tweeting him, but I think he has a great point to add on to your points in the book. And you make the points, you know, more people, more specialization, therefore more learning, new innovations, but also more people just, again, higher probability of someone brilliant being born, more ideas. He would take the argument to the next level and say, look, you have a bunch of people. There's going to be some points of scarcity, you know, clogged roads, climate change. And you need those moments of tension, those moments of scarcity for us to innovate. You know, that's what drives us change is when you come to these pressure points, this pain, right? And this is, I think, another point that you allude to in your book is if you had a billion people, we would be forced to make choices and to think about what trade-offs we really want it to uh, go down. And I think we would see some of the policies we've longed for that would lead us in that direction. Well, let's move on the time we have left to a few other areas in your book. So I know one of the immediate pushbacks to this, if someone's listening who hasn't thought about these issues, or this is the first time, they'll say, what about transportation? What about traffic? So you have some good responses to that. So walk us through that. Yeah, I mean, I love transportation policy. And on some level, this whole book was a pretext to write about how we can deal with traffic jams, because it's such a sticking point on so many things, right? Like, on both local politics, but also big macro politics, people are like, what? It's going to be traffic jams, right? And it frustrates me because there's like... Economists often make a lot of like bold claims for themselves. And some of the times those claims are not really correct. And they don't know the secrets to economic growth and things like that. But we really can solve traffic jams by charging for the use of roads. 
the theory behind that is sound in practice where it's been tried in Singapore and Oslo and Stockholm. Now in London, it will be coming to New York soon in modified form. Like it works really well if you charge people to go on the road in proportion to demand, you can get the roads flowing at a high capacity. Of course, people don't like to pay for things, but we have a lot of taxes, right? It's not like we're not paying any money to our local governments. So if your local government acquired a huge stack of money by eliminating traffic jams, they could then use that to like have lower sales taxes or lower property taxes or whatever else, and we'd all be very happy. Then, you know, to have really big, dense cities, you need mass transit. So I talk about some of the sort of best practices in transit planning from Northern Europe and and, and East Asia, and, you know, what we can do there. I, of course, you know, I mean, the United States is mostly a country of people who drive around, even at a billion. I mean, Something I wish American progressives appreciated more because a lot of them admire aspects of the European and Asian built environment. And I think rightly so. But like Germany is six times as densely populated as the United States. Obviously, a country like that is going to have more people using public transportation. So, you know, I I do it the other way. It's like, if we tripled the population, we would need to import some of these like European urban planning concepts, which I think is correct. What a lot of my progressive friends are like, well, we should import these European transportation planning concepts. But it's like, why? It's intuitive to them. Because like, if you get into the headspace of like Munich is awesome, then like it makes a lot of sense. But like most Americans live in low density suburbs of cheap mid-sized cities. So where would they take the train? It doesn't actually make sense unless you posit some kind of large increase in the number of people here, or you're just specifically talking about New York City, which is where a lot of journalists live, obviously. Uh, No, you know, so it gets a lot of coverage, but it's a very eccentric case, right? It's the fifth largest city in the world. And the United States is not close. The the other really big cities are in like Japan, which has such a more dense. So I'm sorry, put it another way. Tokyo is less of an outlier relative to other Japanese cities than New York is compared to other American cities because Osaka and all those other cities are also big densities. America's not like that. So when journalists like sit around on the broken subway trying to get from Queens to somewhere, it's very real in their lives, but like has almost no relevance to mainstream American lifestyle unless the country becomes a lot denser. That's a good point. And going back to what I said earlier here, this is a case where necessity would lead to the innovation. You need that pressure point. And right now, we don't have it in some parts of, of America. As we mentioned, Detroit, some of these Midwestern cities, actually, it's going the other direction. And I think tied to this and complementing this is your discussion on housing, which we don't have time to get into. But you'd want to have more dense housing you know, near the mass transits, minimize the driving, so forth. So I'll let listeners take a look at that in the book. What I do want to touch on in our last few minutes here is the secular stagnation argument. So we've been waiting for this point, Matt, because I know probably you haven't discussed this a whole lot with your other interviews you've done for the book. But talk us through why population might actually be good for beating the secular stagnation dragon that's in our world right now. I was interested. Larry Summers kicked off the sort of modern secular stagnation conversation a few years ago. So I actually went back and looked at what Alvin Hansen had said about this, because he was the one who invented the phrase. And it was interesting. Hansen's presentation of secular stagnation is almost exclusively about population growth, which Summers doesn't talk about at all. So if, if you look at Hansen's argument, right, so he's looking at He says, well, population growth has slowed down dramatically, which was true as of the mid-1940s. And because population growth is so low, there is less demand for physical capital. And because there's so little demand for physical capital, there's not a lot of, you have these low interest rates, like all, all the secular stagnation stuff that Summers talks about falls out of it. And so then, you know, you read it today, knowing the history of the United States, and you're like, well, (laughs) this is not a a dress you would give if you knew the baby boom was right around the corner. And that's, of course, why this whole analysis was like immediately forgotten 
by the economics world because we really swiftly moved into a period of actually very rapid population growth driven first by babies in the 1950s and 1960s, and then by a huge wave of immigration, particularly in the 80s and 90s, in which there was tremendous demand for like houses, basically, but like capital, you know, strip malls, like all all this stuff, right? Like sprawl that exists in the United States. And, you know, so that's resource intensive, right? And that has faded away and I think is oddly missing from Summers's analysis of what it is that's that's going on here. And so if you look internationally, right, all the developed countries are like in a little bit of a stagnation mode, but the highest interest rates are in Australia and the lowest are in Japan. And the US and Europe are in between with Europe's interest rates lower than America's. And that's exactly the rank order of population growth, right? So Australia has what's by contemporary developed country standards, a rapidly growing population. And they consequently, like, they build a lot more stuff in Australia than they do in the United States. In Japan, they don't build anything on net. They do build some things. But in particular, if you want to know, you know, all this stuff about like, well, why are they building all these bridges to nowhere in Japan? Well, imagine like if the Japanese population was growing as rapidly as the Australian population, you wouldn't be like, oh, what can we hire these construction workers to do, right? You would hire them to build houses for people to live in. If you had an uninhabited island and you built a bridge to it, it wouldn't be a bridge to nowhere. People would go live on the island. Right. Like, and that's classic infrastructure. We didn't say the transcontinental railroad was like a train to nowhere. It was a train to the Western United States. Right. But that's because we took for granted in the 19th century that the population was growing. So if you built something that worked, somebody would go live by the train tracks. People would put farms up and they would deliver goods to to market. So the stagnation, I think, is fundamentally a population slowdown issue. So you can deal with it, right? Like the summer, I don't think I totally understand what Summers' proposal for dealing with it is. Something like, I don't know, like whatever it is he thinks will get Democrats to make him Fed chair to be a little mean about it. I think a lot of people resist the conclusion that the government should just run giant open-ended budget deficits, right? Like it's aesthetically troubling to people who think things should be neat and orderly. It's politically troubling to people who don't think money should be wasted, right? I I think a lot of people, like center center to center right people will say, oh, you progressives, like, well, you should be more like those nice Nordics, where they have like a broad tax base and a lot of attention is paid to tax efficiency. And a lot of attention is also paid to the efficacy of the public services, because the idea is loosely speaking that like in Finland, you middle-class Finnish person are going to pay for this public service. So it had better be good. Right. Whereas in America, we have a lot of like, Democrats will rattle off like 17 things they want to do. And then you're like, how are you going to pay for that? It's like, ah, well, tax billionaires. Um, or or now, or they'll say like, oh, MMT, like we don't need to pay for anything. And it's not as wrong as people would like it to be. Like the interest rates really are incredibly low. But I think a lot of people correctly have the intuition that like this is not a great way to run a society, that like our, our public spending should be on worthwhile projects and we should think about priorities. But the only way to do that is to get back in a world where there is meaningful private sector demand for capital. And, you know, some of that is regulatory, but a lot of it is just population. It's like, if nobody lives here, then it's like, well, what are you going to, what would the demand be for? I mean, and I, as, as I read that chapter, I scatterplot came to mind. You mentioned those countries. Australia has the highest interest rates of advanced economies, also highest population growth. And I instantly kind of, my mind mapped out a little scatter plot where you've had interest rates and population on one axis, on the other axis. And then you you would see exactly Japan in one corner, Australia in the other corner, and the US and Europe on that line somewhere. So in practical terms, it would end the zero lower bound challenge that the Fed faces now. It would get back to more normal monetary policy action. So there's a lot of good reasons to want to have more immigrants here. I mean, They would be better off. We would be better off. 
There'd be more satisfaction to all the people who say they want more kids, but they can't have them. There's a lot of lot of changes that we'd have to go through, but I totally endorse this. The message of this book is we need more Americans. And, you know, I think if Jay Powell wants to make some off-topic commentary, he should encourage people to buy my book because this is because everybody is mad all the time that we don't have a more normal monetary policy framework. But like, this is the reason why, like they, they're doing, I I don't know if they're doing everything perfect, but like they're doing what they can in a world of very low population growth and structurally low demand for physical capital. And maybe people won't listen, but like, that is the reason, right? Like if you are annoyed that they can't just fiddle with the fed funds rate, it's because the population isn't growing. If you're one of the people also who are worried about, you know, savers being harmed by low rates, this is the answer. This is the ultimate deep answer here. Again, higher fertility rate is one part of the solution, but that's going to take a long time. So higher immigration, legal immigration. In fact, one of the things you bring out in the book is President Trump is not just pushing against illegal immigration, but legal immigration. He wants to lower it by 50%. The path we're on is not a very hopeful one in terms of population growth. If the policies we have in place continue, we're going to keep going down the wrong path. And that's alarming to think about. And you can't help but think about it as you read this book. And with that, I have to stop here. Our time is up. Our guest today has been Matt Iglesias. His book is called One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger. Matt, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.